so-called universities are being devalued to the point where uh, they don't really exist much anymore. <laughs> They're not worth anything. And so where is this all going? Well, it's all going towards gnosis. The people who fall in line or aren't able to stand up are going to be the sheeple. And why are they going to be the sheeple? Why are they going to be the cattle? The, you know, the, the cattle? Because these are the people who are going to be sacrificed. They're the sacrifice of the gods. The ones who are not going to be sacrificed are the priests. Those are the illuminated ones. And being illuminated, the, the, the Illuminati, if you will, uh, is not a degree. It's a demonstration of, a, of a, a sense of knowledge about the things that are going on around you. If you do not have this perspective, this point of view, then you will not be saved. The problem is, even if you can demonstrate this, there are those who fake it. Particularly on the left-hand path. Whose sole purpose is evil. They're there to trick people. They want to pull people off the path. Path of truth. Path of reality. Path of immortality. Because they believe the magic that's there is, it is finite. So the more people they can pull away from that magic, the more it is for them. That's what they're convinced of. They're not told, and this is where it's also deceit, it is not told, it is not told to them, it is not expressed to them, that at the end of it all, they're going to die, that they're going to be destroyed. That they're not going to receive the reward that they were promised or expected. This is a deceit. And it comes up, actually, in the uh, death books, the, uh, the tomes of uh, the Vikings. And you look at this into the tale of Valhalla. And what are they talking about? They're talking about people in caves who will be the soldiers in warfare of the last battle. The battle of the, Apoc of the Apocalypse. And in this battle, at the Apocalypse, they will ride out and be defeated, they will be destroyed as the enemies of God. This is Valhalla, this is the promise. How do you get into Valhalla? Well, the death ritual involves sexual, sexual mutilation of the favorite slave girl. In other words, you're attacking the lowest person, the least 
of man to their death. And this is how you enter Valhalla. The more you destroy, the more praise you get in Valhalla, the higher the position. But at the end of Valhalla, at the end of the, the, the time, and there's going to be a limited time, they're all going to be destroyed. All. Again, but this is, people will ignore that last part, just the way people will ignore the prodigal son, that he returns as the son of God. He returns as the son of the father. Again, this is anthropomorphic. The son is not specific to man in terms of the gender. It, it's anthropomorphic. And they only look at the servant aspect. Of it. They're only going back as a servant. Again, this is a distraction. This is a pulling away, even though they call themselves Christians. But they think they aren't Christians. In order to be a Christian, in order to be recognized as one of the Creator, you have to wear Christ. In order to be get there, you have the, the garment you have to be wearing. They talk about a garment. The garment you have to be wearing is the garment of Christ. If you are not wearing the garment of Christ, he will, you will not be recognized as one. And so, but the thing is, this is not understood in the West. It was understood in the East, but that the Eastern Church, most of the Eastern Church, is completely gone. It's not around anymore. And the Eastern Church was just, about, just as much a path, and we're all, and, 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 and this is where you have, in terms of Gnosis, the beginning of Gnosis, no matter what path you're on, the beginning of all of Gnosis is humility. It is the selflessness. Why selflessness? Because in order to see beyond yourself, beyond and the thing that blinds you, the thing that's very bright, is your own ego. You have to conquer your own ego. This is the difficult part. You have to conquer the things you desire. If you cannot conquer the things you desire, you cannot see beyond. And this, these meditations, you know, vegan, oh yeah, I'm cleaning my body. No, you're not cleaning your body. If, you, if you're going to a guru, because there's a lot of gurus out there, and they're telling you that being a vegan is going to clean your body, you're on the left-hand path. You're going, you're going towards spiritual destruction. But the dharmic path, the spiritual path, and this is true for all of yoga and Hinduism, and Hindu, yoga is part of Hinduism. The dharmic life is a spiritual life. To achieve the spiritual life, you need to be selfless. The exercise of veganism, of, of vegetarianism, is about selflessness. It has nothing to do with cleansing your body. Nor does it have anything to do with aligning the chakras. Once again, the chakras, in, in the, that practice of yoga, the, that practice of yoga is a left-hand path. Is left-hand path. Because it's about the body. Anything that's about the body, anything that's about preserving the body, making sure the body is your temple, and ignores the soul, well, guess what? You're on the left-hand path. Because the, the right-hand path is dharmic. It's about the spiritual life, not about the physical life. This is why Christ was crucified on the cross. This is what a lot of people can't understand. Oh, he had to be crucified. No, he didn't have to be crucified. This was self-sacrifice. This was the sense of the dharmic sense of selflessness. And there are a lot of people who just simply don't understand. This includes the Catholics and the Protestants who couldn't understand, and even the Muslims, why is God a prophet? Because, well, God can't be killed on the cross. But the thing is, God was killed on the cross and then was resurrected again because he was demonstrating the way. He was self He was sacrificing. This is the Dharma sense. But the thing is, the, most of your, 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 your right-hand path still sit within what's called the Gnostic Paganism understanding of the universe, and in many cases the multi-universe, because we're talking about parallel universes, which aren't fundamentally parallel. <laughs> there isn't fundamentally a parallel universe. Parallel is con convenient in its terminology. But the universe, the universe itself is far from Euclidean. 
I mean, in Euclidean means flat space. Euclid, Euclid gave us a uh, uh, called flat space geometry. This is where the Cartesians were brought up. And this is why the Cartesians were, and this is Voltaire's objection, the Cartesians were Gnostics. They believed in the magic of, uh, the magic of geometry. The magic of geometry can give you eternal life, but it can't. <laughs> Only the relationship, the personal relationship, was Christ, or, or with Christ can, but again, that was a form of deception. The thing is that the universe cannot be described in a flat space. All, all you have to do is look at time. Time. And we talk about geometry. We talk about parallel and perpendicular. After the third dimension, uh, time as, as the part of the dimension of, of space and time, space-time continuum. But what are we talking about here? Time collapses the called the Cartesian coordinates. Because in order for a Cartesian coordinate, the, the flat space or the Euclidean geometry to exist, you need right angles. Lines need to intersect each other at right angles. This is also Pythagoras. The problem with time is that time is perpendicular at right angles to all the axes of space, x, y, and z. At the same time, we're running into initial simultaneity. As we move into a position of, of simultaneity, this is what we're talking about uh, superposition not being simply an idea, but part of the, it's called the multi-universe reality. It's part of the parallel universe. So the parallel universe, in its Cartesian sense, doesn't exist. We're simply using the Cartesian term to describe something that's beyond our understanding. Less than four, about three and a half hours left. I'll bring you through 24 hours. Turn the turn signals on again. Forgot to do that. Adjust my mirror now. There we go. Getting more of the editing done. I had to get more editing done because there'll be another week where I won't be able to edit and, po and post because uh, I'll be up north. Uh, the, the, the signal is good in terms of uh, receiving stuff, and it's but in terms of posting, it's not so good right now. But it's also the the data in terms of the overages, in terms of the data limit, the data cap, uh, you don't have that much, so it limits what you can do.
out. We are off to the races. A little wet on the street, so extra caution is advised, and so that's what I'll be doing. It's observation season again in terms of atmospheric physics, so I'll be doing that when I get back. Typically, in the it's basically as you move into the fall, uh, late summer. Uh, early fall, that's when you begin, and it's typically at night as the sun goes down, you want to see how the atmosphere shifts, and you want to match it up with what you're seeing on the satellite. This gives you an understand, a better understanding, this is what I'm working on now, is to get a better understanding on the, of the second layer of the atmosphere. There's three layers. I have a pretty good understanding of the, of, of the bottom layer. Now I want to get the mid layer, the second layer. And then from there I'll move on to probably take me a year to do that. And then uh, from there I'll move to uh, the top layer. Oh. It was raining out earlier. Torrential storm, but now it's all cleared up. So when I came, it was clear, and now that I'm going home, it's clear in terms of the sky, but the streets are still pretty wet. Back to our discussion uh, as to where things are going. I said we're moving back in these spheres of, of noses, but right now, this is what happens in, in, the, in the transition period. There is, the, the transition period is partially what was there before, and this is basically humanism. Uh, but more and more as the humanism collapses and fails, they'll move further and further into Gnosis. And this is, uh, again, not something new, this is something that's happened before. It's always where there's a battle between, in terms of the elites, between the humanists, who were the reformers, and the, um, the Gnostics, who were primarily, they're the, uh, they're the powers behind the imperial thrones. So these people aren't minor. They're not small people because they act. They, they, they acted for the crowns of Europe. They're, they were the, the power behind the crowns of Europe. I mean, the reason why you have the crowns of Europe, the imperial system is because of Gnosis. It came out of Gnosis. This is why the kings and queens were considered to be divinely allowed to rule by divine ascent. There was, their rule was God-given. And this is Gnosis. That, 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 that people are ordained by God to rule over certain people. To keep them as slaves. And this was the difference between... This is why... It was a matter of heredity. You had to be, you had to inherit the power. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, something you earned. It was something you were born with. But recently, that's kind of fallen off. The whole concept of the heredity that's still there, but they're now looking for it in other places. People who, who, for some reason, even if they're low born become enlightened, sufficiently enlightened, that they now are at the stage of Illuminati, they, they, they sort of have this sort of wisdom, the knowledge, and these are the people who many people will probably go down as, as sages, uh, uh, gurus, yogis, so on and so forth. These are the priests of the system. The 
system always looks for excuses. Look, looks for excuses. And this, this is what this. Uh, all you have to do is go into and understand the history of the Dalai Lama, and you'll see this. So what happens again? The Dalai Lama is not a is not a light figure. He's not sort of a, in terms of the political sense. He's not a you know a, a newbie. The Dalai Lama, at his age, has been groomed for his entire life for the role he's playing. And so, Gnosis does indeed play a huge role in the world today. And it's always been split like this. Even in the 60s, it wasn't just humanism. Timothy Leary was a humanist. But his partner that he worked with wasn't a humanist. He was a Gnostic. And this is why his name is Ram Das. He ended up, like uh, many Americans in that, in that time period, going to India and, and being taught by a guru to become enlightened, to become a guru himself, and that's what happened. And it was this guy, Ram Das, why is this, you know, you've never really heard of him before, but have you ever heard of Oprah? Well, Oprah came from this guy, Ron Das. She was a disciple. Now, <laughs> and so, and, and she's the one, she's, you know, a lot of, People don't realize that uh, 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 Oprah was the power behind Obama. So there is that understanding there of the power of Gnosis, the power of this so-called knowledge and wisdom, that it can become very, very powerful. And this is what Pizza Gate was about. Pizza Gate is basically the same thing with spirit cooking. Well, this is. Madonna is certainly no stranger to this. But Madonna, if you look at the, at, at sort of the terms of Gnosis, they don't have her on the right-hand path of Buddha and Christ. They have her in terms of the, the, the standard understanding. They have Madonna on the left-hand path with Baphomet and Aleister Crowley. Who were definitely on the demonic path. The left hand path is the demonic. And here's the kicker. The left is aptly named because they are on the left hand path. They present themselves as humanists, they present themselves as philanthropists, but they are on the left hand path. They are demonic, fully demonic. 